There are four major steps in this protocol, including number one, multiplex PCR, number two, nested PCR, number three, digestion of nested PCR products by restriction enzymes and gel electrophoresis, and number four, data collection and analysis. The first step, multiplex PCR, is used to amplify many different DNA sequences in one reaction. This is particularly important when samples are in small volume with low DNA concentration. In this step, 11 sets of external primers are used to amplify 11 different DNA sequences, which we call genetic markers. The amplified sequences are 700 to 1000 base pairs in size. This step increases the number of DNA templates for nested PCR. However, DNA concentration is still too low to be visible on agarose gel. The second step, nested PCR, is used to amplify one marker at a time. For each marker, a specific set of forward and reverse primers is used to amplify one type of DNA sequence. These primers are internal to the corresponding multiplex PCR product. Therefore, the nested PCR product is smaller than the multiplex PCR product. After nested PCR, the products are in high concentration and can be visualized on agarose gel. The third step, digestion of nested PCR products by restriction enzymes, is used to reveal polymorphisms of DNA sequences among different strains of Toxoplasma gondii. Genetic markers were developed based on DNA sequence polymorphisms among reference strains. These markers are used to identify unknown strains. Gel electrophoresis is used to separate DNA fragments by molecular size. Agarose gel is a porous matrix. The size of the pores in the matrix is determined by the concentration of agarose. The higher the concentration, the smaller the pore size. A large pore size is best when separating large DNA molecules, and a small pore size is best when separating small DNA molecules. In this protocol, 1.5% agarose gel is used to check multiplex PCR products, and 2.5 to 3% agarose gel is used to check digested nested PCR products. Data collection and analysis is the last step in genotyping. In this step, DNA fragment patterns from gel electrophoresis are recorded for each unknown sample. These patterns are compared against a set of reference Toxoplasma gondii strains. The collection of patterns from all 11 genetic markers determine the genotype of a given unknown strain. Now we start with multiplex PCR. First, clean your workspace properly to avoid contamination of the samples. Next, determine how many samples will be analyzed. Here, we use a 96 well plate for PCR. To be economically efficient, it is preferred to have 30 or more samples for this protocol. If only analyzing a few samples, we recommend using microtubes instead. For each batch of samples to be analyzed, eight reference Toxoplasma samples are included and placed in a central column. For each column, one negative control should be included. These negative controls are used to monitor contamination during PCR. Label the 96 well PCR plate with a permanent marker according to the sample layout. Circle reference Toxoplasma samples in all wells that are negative controls and label the bottom of each row with the name of the sample contained in the well directly above. This labeling will help you track the wells as you progress through the protocol. Your 96 well plate should look like this when you are finished labeling. Gather all your supplies and reagents in the PCR working station. The supplies include pipettes, filter tips, and a container to dispose of used pipette tips. It is important to note that filter tips should be used for multiplex PCR to avoid contamination of samples from the pipette. Thaw all reagents at room temperature for 20 minutes. The reagents include DNA grade water, 10x PCR buffer, DNTP mix, 25 millimolar magnesium chloride, and multiplex forward and reverse primers. It is recommended to not remove the fast start DNA polymerase from the negative 20 degrees Celsius freezer 
until time to add it to the master multiplex PCR mixture. Or an alternative is to keep the DNA polymerase in a cold block. Keeping the DNA polymerase at a low temperature prevents degradation of the enzyme. Now it is time to assemble the multiplex PCR mixture. This list shows the amount of each reagent needed for one reaction or one well. Normally, it is good practice to prepare enough mixture for at least two extra reactions. So if you're running 48 samples like we are here, prepare enough of the mixture for 50 samples as shown. When all reagents are thawed, mix each tube well and spin down briefly in a centrifuge. This will draw the liquid toward the bottom of each tube and prevent contamination from splattering liquid. Also, make sure to balance the centrifuge with tubes containing equal volumes of liquid. Now add the proper amount of each reagent to a tube labeled multiplex PCR mix. Add the fast start DNA polymerase last as listed on the protocol. When you are done adding the reagents, mix thoroughly by pipetting several times. Aliquot 23.5 microliters of PCR mix to each well. While pipetting, touch the pipette tip to the very bottom of the well to ensure the mixture does not stick to the sides of the well. When you are finished, lightly tap the well plate and hold up to the light to ensure each well has received the PCR mixture. Mix and spin the DNA samples before adding them to the well plate. Add 1.5 microliters of each DNA sample to its appropriate well according to the template. Notice how each well is being tracked with the pipette tip after the DNA sample has been added to the well. Additionally, each tube containing a DNA sample is placed on a different row in the rack after it has been used. It is sound lab technique to track which well has been loaded. After all wells have been loaded, seal each column with strip caps. Place caps on each column that has been loaded with DNA samples and also on the outermost column as shown. This outermost seal will keep the thermocycler lid from being off balance and unequally transferring heat to the samples. Press down firmly on each sealer to ensure there is no sample leakage. Now it is time to amplify the DNA samples using a thermocycler. Place the loaded well plate in the thermocycler and press down firmly to ensure that the plate is level and that the heat will be evenly distributed. Close the lid and set the thermocycler to the 96 well plate setting. Heat the samples at 95 degrees Celsius for 4 minutes, then run 30 PCR cycles of 94 degrees Celsius for 30 seconds, 55 degrees Celsius for one minute, and 72 degrees Celsius for two minutes. After this, you may keep the PCR plate at 15 degrees Celsius until ready to remove from thermocycler. Once you remove the well plate from the thermocycler, carefully remove the caps and avoid splattering of the liquid. Add 25 microliters of PCR water to each well. Be aware that the tip should not touch the inside wall of the wells. This will prevent contamination between wells. Gently tap the plate to draw all liquid to the bottom of the wells. Hold the plate up to the light to make sure all wells contain about the same volume and reseal the plate with the plastic sealers. Place the well plate in the freezer for later use or proceed immediately to the nested PCR protocol. Now it is time for nested PCR. This procedure is similar to multiplex PCR, except that only one set of primers is used for each marker. Label the nested PCR well plate according to the DNA sample template, just like you did for the multiplex PCR well plate. Gather the necessary reagents, spin them in the centrifuge, and assemble the nested PCR mixture according to this list. Once again, it is a sound lab practice to prepare enough mixture for at least two more reactions so you don't run out of the mixture at the end.
Add 23.5 microliters of the nested PCR mixture to each well and make sure each well received the nested PCR mixture. Next, mm -hmm. add 1.8 microliters of the multiplex PCR products to each well using a multi-channel pipette. Always make sure each pipette tip is firmly attached to the pipette before transferring any liquid. To ensure DNA samples are added to each well, it is necessary that the tips touch the very bottom of each well. Mix well by pipetting several times. A good way to keep track of the columns is to put a lid over the columns that already contain the multiplex PCR products. This will ensure that a certain column does not get skipped or double loaded. When you are finished, Gently tap the well plate and hold up to the light to make sure each well contains an equal volume of liquid. Seal all wells with strip caps and move on to the thermocycler. Heat the samples in a thermocycler at 95 degrees Celsius for 4 minutes. Then, run 35 PCR cycles of 94 degrees Celsius for 30 seconds, 60 degrees Celsius for 1 minute, and 72 degrees Celsius for 1 and a half minutes. You may keep the samples at 15 degrees Celsius until you are ready to take them out of the thermocycler. Now it is time for step three, digestion of the nested PCR products. Restriction enzymes will cut the amplified DNA at specific sites, and when these cut fragments are run on a gel, distinct patterns can be detected. These patterns determine the type of T. gondii strain for each sample. It is necessary to determine which restriction enzymes and buffers are needed and what the incubation temperatures should be for each marker. Refer to Table 1 in the written protocol for this information. Here, we will use a thermocycler to incubate our samples for 30 minutes at a low temperature, then 30 minutes at a high temperature. There are a couple things to note here. First, if you are using a water bath and or a heat block to incubate your samples, make sure to preheat those before proceeding through the rest of the protocol. Second, if you are using more than one restriction enzyme on the same plate, make sure their incubation temperatures are the same. Label the well plate according to the DNA sample template as before. Now prepare the digestion mix. Gather all necessary reagents and spin them in a centrifuge. Assemble the digestion mix according to this list. Aliquot 17 microliters of the digestion mix to each well using proper lab technique. Then, add 3 microliters of the nested PCR products to each well. Carefully seal the well plate with sealing tape and press down firmly around the edges. Incubate the well plate for one hour at the appropriate temperature or temperatures. Now it is time to prepare the digestion products so they can be visualized on agarose gel. Pour 1x SB buffer into the gel box you will be using. Add enough buffer to cover the gel once it is inserted into the box. Now it is time to make the gel. Measure out 6.25 grams of agarose and pour into an Erlenmeyer flask containing 250 milliliters of 1x SB buffer. Microwave the mixture for three to four minutes or until no chunks are visible. Also, air bubbles should be freely escaping from the mixture. Place the flask under running water to cool it down to about 60 degrees Celsius, swirling the flask to prevent solidification of the gel inside the flask. Once the flask is cool enough to touch and has stopped evolving vapors, add 5 microliters of ethidium bromide. Ethidium bromide is a known carcinogen 
and it is important to not add this to a bubbling mixture as the fumes will be very harmful. After adding the ethidium bromide to the mixture, gently swirl and pour into a casting tray. Add the combs and allow the gel to solidify. This usually takes about 30 minutes. When the incubation is finished, remove the well plate from the incubator and add 4 microliters of 5x loading dye to each well. Now it is time to load the gel. Use a multi-channel pipette to load 20 microliters of the DNA samples into each well. Make sure to skip the two wells on the end of each row and keep track of how you are loading the gel. Make sure to load the reference samples in the middle of each row. This will help you when it comes time to analyze the gel. If you are having trouble keeping your pipetting hand steady, simply stabilize it with your other hand as shown. Also, when pipetting the samples, make sure each pipette tip on the multi-channel pipette is filled with liquid before inserting it into the gel. Press the pipette tips into the wells, but not all the way to the bottom. Leave just enough room for the liquid to escape from the pipette tips. Finally, add 5 microliters of the DNA ladder to each well at the end of each row. It should also be noted that here we are filling only one row with samples. This is for demonstration purposes only. For this size of gel, you may run up to four rows of samples. When you are done loading the gel, make sure the SB buffer is covering the gel completely, plug in the gel electrophoresis machine, and set it to run at 80 to 120 volts for approximately an hour and a half. A good way to double check that the electrophoresis machine is properly working is to look for small bubbles being formed at the top or negative end of the gel box. Allow your sample to separate, then move on to the data collection and analysis step. This instructional video has been brought to you from the lab of Dr. Chun Lee Su at the beautiful University of Tennessee in Knoxville. So it keeps the weight, so it won't solidify on that wheel.